Today we're going to be dealing with heuristics and paradigms. So, has anyone heard the word heuristic before? Just type it in the chat. Uh, I think that we'll be using the chat a lot. It seems to be a good function for uh, interaction. I'm not muted, am I? No, I'm not muted. Good. good. Yeah, I might have a few too many tabs. Um, <clears throat> no one's heard of heuristics. Good. Oh, person's heard of heuristics. But people don't know what that is. That is good because I also only learned what it is very recently. Hey, Hector has the right idea. Now people know what it is. Oh, that's you. Okay, we have a person that gave a definition, another person that gave a definition, which is a good definition but uh, probably applies more to social science than computer science, but is an interesting definition. I haven't heard that one before. Uh, yeah, when you help someone learn something by themselves, which maybe that is a separate definition uh, for uh, heuristic, but that's not the one we'll be using today. Very interesting to know though. And Alexis did an assessment on it, so probably knows what it is too. So heuristic is like a very, common word in so many different uh, in so many different scientific fields so it does not surprise me one bit that there would be like a different definition being shared in the chat than the one that I'm about to present not even one bit because it's a very it's a cool word and people like to use it anyway can probably get off the first page now admit we're up to 16 people now that's pretty good uh, okay I can probably get rid of this Okay, so again, we're going to start things off with the Google definition. A paradigm is a typical example or pattern of something, a pattern or a model. So, for example, as they say, uh, they've got society's paradigm of the ideal woman. And today we'll be dealing with paradigms of algorithms. A paradigm in algorithms is not a typical example so much as the pattern idea, it's like a model of an algorithm. It'll make a lot more sense when I start when I start going into the examples. Uh, and here we have these little egg shapers. Now I'm not quite sure why I included the egg shapers. I think it was because at, at the start I was like making some kind of metaphor about how the eggs are like algorithms and the shapers are like paradigms. They shape the way that algorithms work. They shape them into different structures and so forth. I realized it was a pretty bad metaphor. But it's also really cool. You, you can shape eggs into different shapes. So I keep the image. Anyway, we're going to look at a couple different paradigms of algorithm design. And hopefully it will make sense. So start off with brute force, which is a very commonly used paradigm. And a paradigm will definitely come across quite a bit in this course, albeit not so much as more sophisticated ones. So brute force, like the emoji, is when you just try to do everything. Like you just run through every possibility, every combination, every input. Exactly, trial and error, trial and error. So it's a really, really bad idea, except when the numbers involved are small, in which case it's often a really good idea to just try and compute by enumerating all possibilities. So in the case of a Sudoku, who's run into a Sudoku before, probably a lot of people, uh, but for those who have not run into a Sudoku before, I'm going to go back and make a full screen and show an image of a Sudoku. So a Sudoku is a grid where you're just trying to put in numbers and fill it up. They give you some numbers at the start and you put in numbers. Yeah, trial and error is also a very good way to solve math problems. For example, if someone asked you 2x plus 6 equals uh, 12, find x. You could use algebraic manipulation techniques and go, ah, x is 3. Or you could just go, okay, let's try x is 1. 2 times 1 plus 6 is 8. Nope. x is 2. 2 times 2 plus 6 is 10. Nope. x is 3. Oh yeah, that works. And then you're done. In the case of a Sudoku, however, it doesn't work quite so well because, well, for a Sudoku, a brute force solution would involve just uh, randomly filling up the grid with all of the different numbers checking if that's a valid solution and then not doing it. And then if it's not a valid solution, just like 
doing the next one. So at the start, you would, for example, every blank space here would be replaced with a one. And then you would maybe change this last one to a two, and then this last one to a three, and just run through all the numbers until eventually you've tried all of the different possible combinations of numbers in these blank spaces. So that would take, probably off the top of my head, that would take longer than the Earth has been around. So it would, on an average computer, or even on a supercomputer, it just would not be a good idea to solve a Sudoku with brute force like that. It just wouldn't. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I actually defined a Sudoku, got interrupted by the chat. Uh, so a Sudoku is when you put all the numbers in and you try to make it so that in each little box, there's all the numbers from one to nine. In each row, there's all the numbers from one to nine. And in each column, there's all the numbers from one to nine. So yeah, that's a Sudoku. Oh dear. Just a moment. That's quite a pickle. When you have several hundred tabs open, this tends to happen. Give me a minute to get a battery charger. That's quite unfortunate. Okay. Yeah, quite unfortunate. Uh, talk among yourselves. Discuss the concept of Sudoku, I guess. Well, that was an unfortunate occurrence. Uh, oh, uh, just a moment. I hadn't got my charger. Yes, what an unfortunate occurrence. Anyway, I got it. We've only lost like one minute, so I think we're fine. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a pickle, but we're back to it. So yeah, brute force is a bad way to solve a Sudoku. What's a better way to solve a pseudo? How about this one? So backtracking is, a, is like brute force, but a little bit more intelligent. A lot of us might have used it when solving a maze. You start moving your pencil through the maze, and you realize, hey, this is a dead end. OK, admit. So you realize, hey, if I go down this lift passage, it's a dead end. So instead of checking all the different paths that go down the lift passage, you're just like, hey, this is a dead end. I'm going to move on to a different passage, the right passage or whatever. In the case of a Sudoku, it's like, as soon as an error occurs, it knows, hey, in, in, instead of just like filling up all the rows and columns with all these empty spaces with numbers immediately, it fills them up like uh, one by one. Say it puts a one here and then a one here and goes, oh, we've got two ones in the same col in the same row. That's bad. So I'm no longer going to do that. I'm going to put a one here and a two here and a one here. Oh, two ones in the same column. That's bad. Uh, row again. Ugh. So I'm going to put a two here. Oh, no. One, two, two. That's bad two ones in the same, uh, two twos in the same row. One, two, three, oh, two threes in the same row. One, two, four, that seems good. And it just keeps going. So uh, it's a little more intelligent. It will save you time, but it won't save you much time backtracking. Uh, for the people who have just joined, we're discussing different paradigms of algorithm design. You can design them with, uh, to just brute force through all the possible solutions and check if any one of them is a solution. Typically, when you have a problem, checking whether or not something you have is a solution is a lot easier than finding the solution. For example, if you had a lock and you had a given key, checking whether or not that key works is a lot easier than making your own key and check and then checking if it works. Uh, yeah, it's so brute force exploits that by basically generating all possible keys. And then just checking them one by one. Is this key good? No. Is this key good? No. And so on and so forth, maybe a million times till, is this key good? Yes. And yes, the emoji is a bit weird. Google emojis, they updated them. I'm not sure what's up with that. Anyway, brute force is cool, but backtracking is better. Backtracking, you're going along. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, there's an error. Okay. Well, no matter what, 
if I was to keep going with this, no matter what, it would be wrong, right? If, if you've had an error somewhere along the path, it'll never get better. Whatever Sudoku you ultimately make, if you're filling it up with numbers one by one and you have a mistake somewhere, like a problem, like two numbers that are the same in the same row or column or box, then you know, okay, if I keep going and filling up the Sudoku, it'll, whatever Sudoku I end up with will still be wrong. So I'm just not going to keep going along this path. If you imagine it a bit like, time to open up, dusty Microsoft Paint. If you imagine it a bit like a tree, branching out with every different possible, uh, every different possible decision you can make. For example, uh, in a Sudoku, there would be like, I'm not going to draw this, but there would be like nine branches per box corresponding to the different numbers that you could put in that box. So, or if you're familiar with like multiverse theory or something, you can imagine, oh, I'm branching off into the different multiverses of, I don't know, this is a, that's a bad analogy. Uh, I don't know too much about multiverse theory myself. But uh, like, if you imagine branching off into the different possibilities, well, actually, here's a good one. Imagine that you had a binary lock. A lock which has a binary input. So here you're gonna put like zeros and ones and whatnot, and you're trying to find the password. Uh, and it branches off like this. And you know also that you can like check at some given point if you've only written this much. Where's me eraser? If you've only written like this much of the thing so far, you can check if there's an error. Uh, so most locks don't do this because it would make it, it would make the lock very weak. You can check, for example, if you put in two digits and instead of putting in the whole code and checking if the whole code is right, you could, for some reason, check if only this part of the code is right. Or if there's a mistake in it somewhere. If that was available to you, then you could imagine uh, the tree of possible inputs branching out like this. Uh, to say, in this branch, you put a zero in the first digit, and in this branch, you put a one in the first digit. In this branch, you put a zero in the second and a zero in the first. This branch, you put a zero in the second and a one in the first. This branch, a one in the first, zero in the second. This branch, one in the first, one in the second, and just branches out like that. Backtracking is having the intelligence to realize, hey, if I get to here, and then I check it, and it says that this is wrong, then I probably shouldn't keep checking down here or over here, because if there's already a mistake, why do I keep on going? Like, there's no point. There's just no point in keeping on going. Anyway, I should not pay so much attention to the chat. It's full of strange garbage. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's the basic idea behind backtracking, being a little smarter than just brute forcing everything. But you can get a lot smarter. And algorithms are not just all about putting in different inputs and checking if it's right. Algorithms can get a lot smarter. And with that in mind, let's look at something that's even more intelligent, though still not super optimal. This is a paradigm that we've actually run into before in the last session. Who can remember when in the last session we might have encountered a greedy algorithm? Does anyone remember? We, we did have a greedy algorithm in the last session. No? That is fine. Uh, in the last session, we happened to run into a greedy algorithm when we were doing the problem at the end of the session. Uh, the problem at the end of the session being, yeah, some people are remembering it. Uh, the problem at the end of the session, some of you didn't stick around for that, which is fine, it was uh, optional. But uh, the problem was a problem in code, and it was like you have to make a flower garden or something just to jog the memories of the people who were there. And it was solvable with the greedy algorithm, and that was how we ended up doing it. The greedy algorithm idea in that problem for those who were there was that. At any point, you could change the color of the flower you're looking at to whatever color you want without it having negative consequences for you along the line. Uh, because the color, because the flower had three different color options and it only had to be excluded from being the colors of the two colors of the flowers on either side of it, you, you knew that there would only, always be a color left over for you to change it to. So you could apply greedy reasoning of just going along and removing all mistakes in the flower garden lineup. For those who weren't there for it, or for those who were there for it and don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. Uh, it's not too necessary to understand the discussion here. What a greedy algorithm does is it makes the best decision it thinks it can make at every point. So for example, let's say you're at a buffet and you have decided that you want to get the optimal plate. 
well. Uh, so optimal plate from say one thing from each table. So you start at the entree plate and you, uh, the entree table and you're like, okay, what should I put on my plate? You look at all the different entrees, you evaluate which one's the best and you put it on your plate and you move to the next table. Mains, oh, which one's the best main? I'll take it. Desserts, which one's the best dessert? I'll take it. You take the best food from each table as you move along. And in that case, that gets you the best plate. Or does it? Can anyone think of an idea where that might... Greedy algorithm does not just mean that you take everything. It means that you act greedy, though. You, you try and take the best optimal decisions at each point. So you're not taking, like, at, at the dessert table, there's, like, a jelly and an ice cream and a chocolate cake. You're not like, ah, give me all that. No, that is probably what some of us in the chat and also myself would do. But what you do is you go, okay, the jelly is better than the ice cream and the jelly is worse than the chocolate cake. The chocolate cake is the best. I'm going to take the chocolate cake. And so that's what you do. So, and then you will optimize your buffet plate. Unless the definition of a good buffet plate is a little more subjective. And for example, say that you like, uh, I don't know, good taste combinations. You might, you might think that, oh, on its own, a jelly is worse than an ice cream. I mean, a jelly is worse than a chocolate cake and a sandwich is worse than a lasagna. But sandwiches and jellies go really well together. And so, uh, I don't know. I think I've just invented British food. That's not good. Uh, anyway, there's probably a better example for why greedy algorithms aren't always optimal. And there is. And we're going to show it right now. Once I figure out how to get out of full screen mode. There we go. And this is why I, so this whole time I was actually just stalling, trying to remember why I uh, put in a thing saying crab cakes. Wasn't sure what I meant by that. I remember it now, uh, thankfully, not this. So we're gonna bring up Microsoft Paint again, and we're gonna do some stuff. Let's say you're going around a mountain. So this is to understand why greedy algorithms are sometimes not so good. Greedy algorithms can be good, but they can also be like really, inefficient and they don't solve every problem which is by the way a little weird because when i first heard this i was like what sorry this algorithm is making the optimal decision in your own words at every point surely if it does the best thing at every possible stage then it's going to get the best behavior overall right but as it turns out that's not actually true and here is why so you're at, you're at a mountain and you can't go over the mountain but what you can do is go to the left or right and this is you this poorly drawn smiley face. So you're going around and there are two different paths. And then on the other side is like the place you want to get to. This is the goal. So over here, we have Joe's Crab Shack. This is Joe's Crab Shack and Joe is great at making crab cakes. Makes the best, ca best crab cakes all around. They're cheap, they're good. They have a good texture, they hold together nicely. All in all, it's just a really good place to go if you want a good crab cake. On the other hand, you got Steve's crab cakes. They're not so good. Steve just isn't that good at making crab cakes. So yeah, like if you if you had the choice between two different journeys along the same stretch of road, but one of them had Joe's crab cakes and the other had Steve's, like you're gonna go with Joe. Right past Steve's crab cakes is a section of uninterrupted idyllic vistas of uh, trees and uh, grass and whatnot leading straight up to your goal. This is your goal. I'm gonna give it a G for goal. I'm not too good with the maths, but anyway. And past Joe's crab cakes is the lair of the dragon or the volcano pit or whatever, something really bad. Just, just something that's just not so good through which no traveler has ever passed alive. So, that's the path past Joe's and past Steve's crab cakes. Which path do you take? If you're allergic to crab, then, well, Steve's also has, uh, Steve's and Joe's both also serve an excellent, an excellent selection of uh, drinks and whatnot, but Joe's is just superior in every way. And also you cannot, you have to make a choice. You have to go one way or the other. I think there's some old 70s song about that. You have to go one way or the other and you can't go to Joe, get the good crab cakes and then go past Steve. They ignore his crab cakes because they're bad. Enjoy the vista and get to where you need. So, ignoring the sacrifice for the good crab cakes, the best solution is obviously like 
I think this is pretty clear. You take the bad crab cakes, but you don't die. Like, trade-offs, you know? I mean, I would prefer to have good crab cakes and then die fulfilled than to, like, have bad crab cakes. Bad crab cakes, you don't want them. They're, they're awful. But that's getting off track. The point is, you want to go with Steve. Awful as it may sound. Problem is, that's not what a greedy algorithm does. A greedy algorithm will go to Joe's because it makes the optimal decision at each point. It's like if you got to the first table and you were like, oh, this is cool. The first table has uh, an entree of pickled onions or an entree of gold-plated crab cake. And you pick the gold-plated crab cake and then you get to the next table and you find out that having a gold-plated crab cake entitles you to, like, get shot in the head or something. Like, it, greedy algorithms, they don't understand consequences. Basically, the greedy algorithm will go, ah, this is the optimal decision. I'm going to go with Joe. And then it will die. Whereas a not greedy algorithm, and there are not greedy algorithms that can solve these problems, will take the loss at Steve, walk past the view, and get to the goal on time. So, would selling the food and buying an ice cream be an option? Unfortunately, it will not. Very sad. If you are allergic to crab, just substitute ice cream for crab. The, the crab is not the point. The point is greedy algorithms. And I think I've gone in enough detail on them, but the reason I'm going into so much detail on greedy algorithms is because they are a very common unifying theme. You will see a lot of them. Uh, you may have noticed that we haven't actually gone into any actual algorithms. We're just talking about like paradigms and ways to design algorithms, kind of higher knowledge before we delve into the nitty gritty. Don't worry, we have, I think, three sessions devoted just to algorithms, like just examples of algorithms. But it is critical to get this knowledge down first. How are we doing for time? I'm not, I'm not doing so good for time, but that's fine. I'm not going to save, unfortunately. I know this is a work of art, but I'm not going to save it. Uh, okay. 724, that's fine. So, so much for greedy algorithms. We're going to see a lot of them in this course. Let's move on to the next, and equally, and actually a better strategy, which is to divide and conquer the problem that you're facing. This applies in life as much as it applies in computer science. The idea is that you take a problem and you break it down into smaller problems and then you solve the problems on their own and you put it all back together. So for example, if someone gave you like a massive homework task, you might go, ah, oh, Jesus, this, this is a problem. But then if they said, oh, and it's made of 20 multi-choice questions, you break them down into individual problems, solve each of them separately, put it all back together. Divide and conquer is highly effective, especially when you have an ability to break it into smaller problems and then rule out some of the problems and just say you don't have to solve these uh, to get the overall answer. So for example, if someone gave you a homework assignment, which was like, find the solution to this. Have you ever had a homework assignment which, which is like all built around one central question? And then there are a bunch of like smaller questions which are, op which are optional, but if you solve them, it helps you along in the path to finding the big question. But all you need to do to get the marks is solve the big question. Well, divide and conquer is a little like you break it down into the smaller problems and you realize, okay, if I want to solve the big problem, I'm going to have to solve problems A, B, D, but I won't have to solve problems C and E, so I just don't do C and E and I do A, B, and D. There aren't too many good examples of this technique, but it's going to come up later in, one of, in the very first algorithm we study, which is called binary search. It is very useful and used by computers all over the world. So, you know, useful algorithm. Anyway, divide and conquer is a useful paradigm. But you'll notice that I've specified that don't overlap, that don't overlap here. And there is a reason for that somewhat odd, somewhat odd wording. And the reason is that subproblems can overlap. You can break down a big problem into smaller problems, only to find that they're not just evenly compartmentalized, like problems A, B, C, D, E, but a little more overlapping. And many, many, many computer science problems have that property. They have what's called overlapping subproblems. And they also have uh, a common property, which you don't really need to understand, but it's called optimal substructure. And a problem with both of those properties, that it breaks down into problems easy, but the problems overlap with each other, and that it has this thing called optimal substructure, which basically applies to almost all problems. If it is applicable to both of those, it can be solved with the technique of dynamic programming. And now we're getting into the good stuff. Oh yeah. I did say I don't do homework in the previous session, 
Uh, you might have noticed that I was kind of stumbling over my words. That's because I, I don't really know what I'm talking about when it comes to the homework stuff. Sorry. Uh, but if you do, if you do have like some experience with homework, do do tell them. Like, uh, do try to apply it to your own everyday life. And in fact, that's that's a useful segue to a point that I've been uh, wanting to make. Algorithms are not just this high and mighty abstract idea. You can apply and should apply many of these many of these ideas whether it's approaching a problem, whether it's dividing a problem into smaller bits and solving the bits individually that don't overlap, or uh, making optimal decisions at different points to make an optimal uh, outcome overall, or backtracking even, or even greedy brute algorithms, uh, brute force algorithms. You can apply these to daily life, and you might not be, you might even be already applying them to daily life, and not even, and just not giving them these names. And in fact, as we talk about the next one, uh, if you find yourself losing interest in dynamic programming because it's a bit, it's a bit more high level than the other paradigms we've discussed. If you find that happening to you, think about brute force, backtracking, greedy algorithms, divide and conquer, and try to think about a way that you might be using them in your own life. Because I'm confident that for everyone who's watching this course, there will be some way that this applies to you, any one of these. So I'm lagging. That's unfortunate. That is unfortunate. I wonder why that is. Um, I think I'm going to have to do something really tragic. Yeah, close my tabs. So sad. Years of built up knowledge. Oh. No one is microwaving nacho this time, thankfully. Uh, yeah, but we're all good. We're all good on that front. I do hope I didn't accidentally close my uh, my like super important tab that I'm using to teach from. No, I didn't. Let's go. I most certainly wasn't looking at memes. No one saw that. Uh, okay. So is is it still lagging? Uh, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Is everyone hearing me all right? Not as much. Okay, that's good. It's good to hear. Now, it is it is kind of breaking a little. That's a shame, but whatever. Uh, dynamic programming. Dynamic programming. So what you do in dynamic programming is you break up your problems into smaller subproblems that do happen to overlap. So what do I mean by this? And we're going to open Notepad. This one. Who's heard of the Fibonacci sequence? Who's heard of it? Uh, raise your hands or talk in the chat or whatever. We have some raised hands, but many of you probably won't have heard of it. And that is fine because it is something that's reasonably less known. Oh, wait a minute. A lot of people have heard of it. Okay, that is very good to hear. Learned it in the math stage. Ah, that explains it. For those of you who don't know it, it's a sequence that starts with 1, 1. And then from there on, the next term in the sequence is the sum of the previous two. 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8. I hope you see where I'm going from here. Okay, I can add numbers, I hope. Uh, I think that those are the first few terms of this Fibonacci sequence. So, what if you asked a computer algorithm to find this Fibonacci sequence? To find the terms of this Fibonacci sequence? How would you do it? Uh, okay, Jessica. Okay, I guess. Okay. Anyway, ignoring whatever that was. Uh, one way that people do it. Uh, one way that people do it is they take advantage of the recursive properties of the recursive properties of the Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence is, offic is officially defined as the sequence if, such that if uh, 0 equals 1, if 1 equals 1, and if n equals if n minus 1 plus if n minus 2, where these square bracket things, uh, where like if x 
is the X term of the Fibonacci sequence. So for example, if uh, five is, well, one, one, two, three, five. If five is five, so that's a bad example. If six is one, one, two, three, five, eight. If six is eight. So it's officially defined as this. And so I have seen, I've given this as a problem to people and I've seen people try to be real clever and go, ah, I'm going to use recursion to do this. And write, I'm not going to use Python, I'm going to use like a pseudocode thing. I write how to do Fibonacci. This is their program. They go like, okay, to do Fibonacci, if uh, Fibonacci in term, if in is one or zero, the answer is one. So that's these two things. Otherwise, the answer is, I can't spell, the answer is, and instead of how to do Fibonacci nth term, I'm going to replace this with a define function Fibonacci in, which is going, and Fibonacci in is supposed to return the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence. The answer is Fibonacci in minus one plus Fibonacci in minus so this is the recursive way to define it. The problem with the recursive way to define it is that it's not very good. It takes ages to run. And so, so the, the pickle with this recursive definition is let's imagine that we try to apply it. Let's just calculate it by hand. So let's try and calculate if seven, and we'll keep track of how many times we had to calculate each thing. How many times? This will make sense in a second. How many times we had to calculate if one, if two, if three, if four, if five, if six, and if seven. Well, we only had to calculate if seven once, I hope. When we're applying this, we're only gonna have to calculate if seven once. So let's apply it. The Fibonacci of n is seven. So we're doing Fibonacci of seven here. Well, is seven one or zero? No, it, it isn't. Seven is not one or zero. So the answer is Fibonacci of n minus one, which is six, plus Fibonacci of n minus two, which is five. So Fibonacci of seven equals Fibonacci, I'm just gonna use f of six plus f of five. So now we're gonna calculate f of six. So I'll add one tally mark here. Uh, so f of six, that's going to be, well, is six one or zero? Hopefully most people will know that six is not in fact one or zero. Six is just not one or zero. So the answer is going to be Fibonacci of five plus Fibonacci of four. So we're gonna to have to calculate each of these once. Let's start with Fibonacci of five. Hello, late joiner, how you doing? Uh, we're just discussing the Fibonacci sequence right now. And how many times we have to count each thing uh, when we're calculating the Fibonacci sequence with this rather naive recursion definition. So uh, the answer is Fibonacci of six plus Fibonacci of five. In fact, you know what? This is gonna take ages. I'm gonna do it a little faster than this. For those of you who aren't experienced with Python, basically what I'm doing here, Python is a nice programming language in that it looks a lot like English. So uh, just I'll put these side by side to compare. It will look a lot like what I'm writing here. If Fibonacci in, uh, if in equals one or in, equals zero, return, so instead of the answer is we put return one, else instead of otherwise, but aside from that, like else and otherwise are like synonyms in English, so it should be fine, else return Fibonacci in minus one plus Fibonacci in minus two. And one thing that I am going to do here is I'm going to say that it has to print in each time so that we know what's going on. Fib, I'm gonna call this Fib. So tell me, Fib, what is Fibonacci of seven? Okay, that's nice. So it says that Fibonacci of seven is 21. But let's look at all the garbage that's just spewed out above that. So every time that this function was called, it has printed the thing that the function was being called on. So it printed seven once, as we would expect. Six, it had to calculate once. That's no problem. Six is not going to have to be calculated multiple times. 
five it had to calculate once. But well, wait, it had to calculate five again. When it was calculating fib of six, it had to calculate fib of five to calculate fib of six. So it had to calculate what five was twice. It's a bit of weird. Four, it had to calculate once, twice, three times. That's a lot. It's not so good. It's really not so good. So four had to be calculated three times. And by the way, extra for experts, we had to calculate seven once, five twice, four three times, but the pattern isn't one, two, three, because if we look at how many times we had to calculate three, it's three, three, so this is twice so far, three, three times so far, three, four times so far, and three, five times so far. So the, and then if we were to do two, I'm not gonna count them all up, but uh, you would see that we calculated seven once, uh, I'll just write them out here. We did seven once, six had to be calculated, oh wait, six had to be calculated once as well, five had to be calculated twice, Four had to be calculated three times, three had to be calculated five times, two had to be calculated eight times, one had to be calculated 13 times. Me, I haven't seen this sequence before, so I don't know what it means, but anyone who's smarter than me might be able to tell me what this sequence is. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. Certainly isn't written at the top of the page. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make here is that we're doing a lot of work that we really don't need to be doing. Like, uh, you saw how many times that was spamming out different numbers, like, what if we just calculated those once instead of calculating like each one of them, like f of one, we had to check what f of one was 13 times. Surely we don't have to do that, right? Surely we only have to figure out each one once. And the answer is yes. And one way to do this is to uh, make a uh, dictionary. I'm going to call it a dictionary where, uh, where like the input is like, if, if we've already found uh, if we've already found out what Fibonacci of n is, then we're going to put uh, Fibonacci of n in the dictionary under the entry of n. So uh, make a dictionary called dix, e on -ary, called dictionary, why not? Uh, make a dictionary called dictionary. And now uh, if n is in the dictionary, then we return uh, the dictionary entry for n. Otherwise, we have to do all this stuff to calculate it, but this speeds it up tremendously. I'm going to try and bring back my code. I'm trying to do that. Uh, so we're going to do like just a quick little thing. Uh, I'm going to do it slightly more weird than that, just uh, because I don't want to write out a bunch of extraneous code. I'm going to call this Dictionary equals this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. That'll be plenty enough. If Fibonacci of n, if dictionary n uh, does not equal zero, that's how you write does not equal. If dictionary of n does not equal zero, so if we've uh, put it in, oh, sorry, I'm stupid. Uh, once you find out what n is, you put it in the dictionary. If dictionary n doesn't equal zero, then we're going to put, uh, uh, then we're going to just return the dictionary entry for n. Uh, people who are experienced with Python, by the way, might get a little confused by the use of the word dictionary. I'm just using it for people who aren't so experienced with Python. Uh, a dictionary is a different thing in Python, but don't get like distracted by that. It's just uh, it's just something I'm doing here. And of course, uh, dictionary zero is one, dictionary one is one, and uh, Fibonacci in minus one plus Fibonacci in minus two. I'm going to do that to make a thing called answer equals Fibonacci in minus one plus Fibonacci in minus two. And now dictionary in is going to be the answer. And now we return the answer. Hopefully this won't embarrass me like it did before. Uh, in the last section, I was embarrassed by this unfortunate thing. Oh, would you look at that? This is a far cry, this here. 
is a far cry from this here. We didn't have to recalculate anything. Isn't that a great thing? We didn't have to do all this extraneous calculation because we did what's called memoization, which is where we put down the results in the dictionary. Someone has a hand raised up. Stop trolling. Okay. I swear I am not trolling. Um, so basically the idea here is, oh good, Fibonacci, uh, we've calculated a lot more efficiently than how we would have had to calculate it if, okay, uh, how we would have had to calculate it if we did this naive brute force attempt. An even faster way to do it, by the way, is to do it the way that we calculated the next term originally uh, by calculating everything only once by uh, just taking one, one, and then uh, finding the next term is two, the next term is the sum of the previous terms, and that way you only have to calculate each term once and you never use a recursion or anything weird and complicated like that. But all that is a sidetrack because it's distracting from the central idea of dynamic programming, which is when the central idea is that you either use recursion or use this calculation thing, but this really basic central idea is that you store what you've already calculated and you use it again later. So in this case, the overlapping here meant what that meant was that we kept on using the same information twice or 13 times in one case. We had to keep finding the same information out. And good morning, uh, good afternoon, good night to the person who just entered. Uh, we're talking about the Fibonacci sequence and more generally about dynamic programming, which is a strategy in which you have a problem, you break it down into small subproblems that overlap and you go, hey, I can exploit this overlapping. Wherever they overlap, I'm going to have to calculate that multiple times. To give a homework related example, because I did that for the previous one, if you had some homework that uh, incidentally, for some reason, required you to find 1,125,248 divided by seven for each different question and each time in a different way, but uh, it had, you had to use that calculation for some reason in each different question. You could do long division for each different question, that's fine. You could treat it like you're just using naive divide and conquer, or you could be smart about it and say, hey, I already did this. I'll just look back at my notes. So that's just the idea of dynamic programming. If it sounds too good to be true, it isn't. Uh, a lot of these might sound almost, a lot of these uh, paradigms, they like paradigms that sounds really fancy, but it's not as fancy as it sounds. Like a lot of these are hopefully intuitive ideas, like making good decisions and breaking down problems into bite-sized pieces and not calculating the same thing twice. Useful things. But now we're going to look at heuristics. What's the time? Okay, that's plenty of time. Heuristics is the shorter section. So a heuristic, who's heard of it? without looking at this definition that I copy pasted from Wikipedia. That is good. We learned something new today. Okay, a heuristic is basically, oh, also ignore this thing up here. It should have been on the next slide. Anyway, a heuristic is a technique for when a problem is just what's called intractable in computer science. Tractable, a problem is tractable when you can solve it easily. A problem is intractable when you can't do that. And there are many intractable problems. And if you have one of those intractable problems, it can be difficult to solve that problem because like it's intractable. But what you can do sometimes is you can apply uh, like intuitive techniques or really weird advanced techniques to solve that problem when normal classical methods are too slow. So this one here, Google didn't have a good definition, so I used the Wikipedia one. And by the way, let's notice this word here. I want to call back to, I'm not sure what his name was, uh, but some intelligent young person said shortcut when I asked about heuristics for the first time. And that is absolutely the right idea. A heuristic is a shortcut. The problem with shortcuts is that if it was like, if it worked all the time, well, that would just be the algorithm. The problem wouldn't be intractable if your heuristic worked all the time. So it trades, well, it says here, it trades optimality, completeness, accuracy, or precision for speed. Basically, it's wrong, sometimes, but most of the time it is right. Here are some examples. What's the best move in this position, people? 
uh, I know this is not a chess thing, but for those of you who do know chess, for those of you, Wikipedia, short 30 second rant, Wikipedia is perfectly valid and you should be perfectly able to use it as a source. It's so strictly moderated. Come on guys, it's perfectly fine. Like people who don't like it just don't know how to use a computer, seriously. Uh, you don't know how to play chess? That is fine. Chess is a game where you try to move your pieces, where you try to move your pieces and take other pieces and eventually put this piece here called the king in what's called checkmate. The pieces move in a variety of different ways, but all you need to know for this puzzle is that this piece here is called the queen. Both sides have a queen. The other side of this queen is up here. It's white's turn. So white is the player with the pieces that are white. And the queen can move diagonally or it can move vertically. It can also move horizontally, but it doesn't have any horizontal moves that don't involve jumping over its own pieces, which is illegal. Uh, you don't need to understand chess for this. I will summarize what a heuristic is at the end of the short chess thing. Queen eat queen. Wouldn't you like to take the queen? Eat the queen. Yes. Everyone is correct here. Notice that white, by the way, like black has a lot of little pieces uh, and white just doesn't. So if you don't eat the queen, you will just be down material and probably lose. But astutely, many people have noticed, hey, this is the most valuable piece here and it's sitting over here undefended and I can just eat it because it's my turn. And yes, you can do that. And you are completely winning if you do that. And that is in fact the only good move. But how did you figure that out? How did you figure out that queen takes queen is a good move? I want us all to think here. How do we realize that? You're good at chess. Ah, but how good are you at chess? Did you look at every single possible move here and calculate, exactly evaluate how good it was? For example, pawn to h4, which is when you move your pawn up to here. This is the pawn. Uh, did you calculate how good that move was when you decided to move to take the queen with the queen? I don't think you did. I do not think you did. And if you did, I don't think you calculated pawn to b3, knight to d2, bishop here, or all of these many, many, many other moves. There's like 30, 40 moves in this position, different legal moves that you could play. You probably didn't calculate queen here because it is a free piece and no list in three different ways. But why did you not calculate that? Maybe if you do that, you sacrifice your queen, but you somehow checkmate the king in like 40 moves by force. Did you calculate every variation by 40 moves? My guess, <laughs> yeah, no, no, and neither did I when I made this puzzle. No one is doing that. Not even computers can do that. But we used a heuristic. We were like, hey, I know how to play chess. And in chess, taking the queen is a good thing. In fact, it's probably the best thing second to checkmate. So you take the queen. That's a heuristic, a rule of thumb, a rule that you can follow and which will almost always be good. And in chess, a great heuristic is take queens when they're free. If your opponent gives you a free queen, take it. Why not? However, I would be remiss not to state that heuristics are not always correct. What is the best move in this position? Another puzzle for you. I'm not sure where this is going, but I like this idea. Whose move? White. Again, white to move. Not sure where the chocolate bar ice cream thing is going, but I like this idea. This might be a good analogy. Keep, keep talking. And yeah, white to play and win. We'll see which move gets suggested first. You may, and you're allergic to chocolate. Hmm. I'm not allergic to chocolate, thankfully. That would be a horrible life. Eat the horse. That is one move that you can play, most definitely. Kill the queen. There's another move you can play, most definitely. This bishop here, this white bishop, uh, for those who don't know, a bishop is a piece that can move diagonally. And in this case, what's this on the diagonal? It's a queen. Yum. Proctor. They can see the direct messages. I like that the person who doesn't know how to play chess said flip the board, and honestly, that's what I would do in this position. <laughs> nah, no lies. That's a reasonable move. Flip the board. I'm not trying to be mean. No, actually, that's a reasonable move in this position. If you're black. If you're black, you flip the board here. Because no one, I repeat, no one who is playing chess, I'll just move this to everyone in meeting, no one who's playing chess wants to get checkmated with pawn to g4 checkmate. No one wants that to happen to them. You would rather flip the board than have that happen to you. So, yeah, taking the queen is great. Taking the free knight is great. But pawn to g4 checkmate is better. So, 
but what's going on here now? Let's think about this properly. Because we had a heuristic. We had a working heuristic. Take queens when they're freed. But in this case, we take this queen when it's freed. Well, that's a good move, but it doesn't win the game on the spot. Pawn to g4 wins the game on the spot. It's just game over. So we have, so the heuristic was wrong. The heuristic, in this case, was wrong. That doesn't mean that we should just abandon the heuristic permanently and just go, ah, well, maybe I shouldn't take queens when they're free. No. The key thing about this heuristic is, A, it's correct almost all the time. I actually had a chess competition today, and I took a free queen. And it just happened. I took a free queen. And I did it without even thinking, because, like, the guy hung his queen, and I took it. And that's because it's a good heuristic. When you have free queens, you take it. But sometimes the heuristic isn't right. And that's the central idea of a heuristic. A heuristic is a rule that you can follow, and it's almost always right, but sometimes it's not. How does it win again after checkmate? Uh, checkmate is when the black king, which is this piece, cannot move. And after this pawn moves up, the black king has no moves, and he's in check with the pawn, if, the, if you imagine the pawn being here. Anyway, enough of that. Chess, that's the idea of oh, heuristic. Oh, tongue tied there. Anyway, we're going to apply that. Well, not that. We don't want you to see that. We're going to apply, uh, since we're almost done here, we're going to apply. I said enough about chess, but actually, it's not enough about chess, unfortunately. Um, very sad. I'm going to open up chess and show you guys how a knight moves. This is the knight. It's shaped like a little horse. And this is how it moves. We're going to put him in the middle of the board and just show you how it moves. These highlighted squares are the squares where a knight can move to. It's, it's, it's a pattern. He can move, he moves up two squares and over, or up two squares and over the other way. Up square, over two squares. Basically, he just moves around like, like this, in a weird L shape. And it's a very common computer science program, uh, problem. It would actually be a terrible move, that free knight. But anyway, it's a common computer science problem. If I took all the pieces off the board here, except for my knight, can you find a way that I can move the knight around and never visit the same square twice and visit every square? That's called a knight's tour. Without Googling the word Warnsdorf's rule, because I don't want no cheating, can anyone think of a good algorithm? The person who cannot chess, uh, all you need to know, you don't need to know, no, no, no. You don't need to know. Yes, uh, the way the knight moves is all you need to know. So, uh, give me a moment, mathsresourcescom slash knights, I will show you how the knight moves. Mathsresources.com slash knights. Here we go. So this is how the knight moves. You see these green squares? These are where the knight can move. These green squares are where the knight can move from where it is now, which is the purple square. Wherever the knight is, is the purple square, and the green squares are the ones where it can move to. So we move him around. He's jumping all over the board. And the rules of this little game that we're playing aren't chess. This is not chess. This is called the knight's tour. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to get this little fellow to go to every single square, visit every square just once, because he doesn't want to go back. It's, it's like when the word tour is specific here. It's like when you're on tour. Like, have you ever gone on a vacation and been on tour and been like, oh, we're visiting the same place twice. Why are we doing that? And this is the hotel. You probably want to go back to the hotel. But aside from that, you don't really want to visit the same place twice, but you want to visit everywhere. And that's the idea of the night's tour. You want to go everywhere. You want to see every square. And then, and most certainly, you don't want to go back where you started. And indeed, here you'll notice that the knight on 17 can move to 16, but the game won't allow that because you've already been there. So uh, you can have a lot of fun, hours of delightful fun, just clicking random squares here and just trying to figure it out. But oh no, I've lost. Look at this. The, the knight here could move to squares 28, 4, 2, and 22. And he... He can't do any of that because those are already visited squares, so I've lost. And look at all these blank squares on the chessboard. I'm just not so good at this, man. Okay, so has anyone thought of an algorithm that they could use to do the knight's tour? Well, not an algorithm so much as a heuristic. Because if I asked you for an algorithm, you'd struggle. And the reason why you'd struggle is because professional computer scientists struggle. And the reason why they struggle is because it's impossible. It's really difficult to find a really good algorithm for night stores. But to find a rule that isn't always right, that is right almost all the time, it's a lot easier. So who can think of a heuristic? Uh, 
I will give you, uh, I keep asking what the time is from my computer. What is the time? It's 7.57, oh Jesus. Okay, I will give you approximately no more time to figure out this heuristic. This is a, the reason why I'm using all this chess stuff. Uh, uh, yes, that is how the night moves indeed. Uh, the reason why I'm using all this chess stuff is because for some reason chess uses a lot of heuristics and Warnsdorf's rule is the most well-known and famous example of a heuristic. You might go like five minutes over and if you don't want that, that is fine. Uh, this is just an example. If you've already got the theory down, the only two concepts you need to take away from this are what is a heuristic and what is a paradigm, an algorithm design paradigm. And we've listed a couple of the examples of algorithm design paradigms. And we've also listed what exactly a heuristic is. And this is the only example we're going into. So for those of you who can't stay five minutes over, that is fine. It's been good talking to you. I will hopefully see you in another lesson. We will be going into some actual algorithms. And for those who are sticking around or who have thought of a good, uh, a good heuristic, we're going to be using one called Warnsdorf's rule, which is this somewhat counterintuitive idea. Move the knight to the square from which it has the fewest moves. Now, why you would do that instead of the most moves, you can try to justify that to yourself. You can go, okay, maybe you want to do that to save the squares with a lot of moves for later or something. But at the heart of it, we don't really need to know why the heuristic works. We only need to know that it works very well. So I'm going to use five times five because I'm in a hurry. I'm going to start here. And we're going to do exactly that. At the start, all the squares have an equal number of moves. So move to them. Now, if we were to move to this square, we would have one move over here, one move over here, one move over here, three. This square, on the other hand, would have one move over here, one move over here, one move over here, three as well. So it doesn't matter. We'll just choose either one. Now, this square here has only one move. This square here has one, two, three, four, five moves. It's got a lot of moves, this one. And this one here also has a lot of moves. Uh, it can't go back to these three, but it can go here. So we're going to use this one because it has the fewest moves. This is Warnsdorf's rule. Now, oh, it, it auto moved me. Uh, since it only had one move, it did the auto move to five, which is a shame because I was going to go, okay, we've only got one move, a move there. But anyway, whatever. Where do we want to move? Do we want to move here, where it has one legal move? Here, where it has one, two, three, le four legal moves? Or here, where it has one, two, three, four legal moves? The first one, correct. And that's where we're going. So now it only has one legal move again. And now where? And you might actually see a pattern here. Uh, I'm just going to start making the moves because we're low on time. Don't want to waste your time. So this is has only one legal move. That's probably good. And that's the move. This leaves you with only one legal move. Also pretty good. And that's the move. This only one legal move. It's pretty good. And that's the move. If we move here, then we'll only have one legal move from that spot. It's pretty good. And that's the move. Just keep doing this, going around. From here, we'll only have one legal move, but from here, we'll also have only one legal move. So it doesn't really matter which one we go to. And indeed, you might see that there's like a symmetry here. All It's like a symmetric little thing. Uh, it, if you ignore the numbers and just look at what which squares we've visited and which ones we haven't, you'll notice it's symmetric, which is cool. We'll go here. Now we can go either of these places. From either one, we'll only have one legal move. Let's do this one. Now we've only got one legal move all the time. And we've solved the puzzle. Warnsdorf's rule, this idea of only go to the squares where you have one legal move, has solved this puzzle. Isn't that cool? Someone in the chat has said yay. Yeah, no, it, it's a yay moment. This, this problem, I, I feel like I'm not doing it justice. This problem stood for like 500 years, and no one could solve it. This fellow Warnsdorf came up with this heuristic. And people were like, oh, well, look at all these idea all these boards where it doesn't work like an eight by six board i don't think it works or something like that on an eight board on an eight by six board warnsdorf's rule just breaks down completely and doesn't find the right squares but the thing about warnsdorf's rule is it works and it works really well it doesn't work all the time like in our like in our previous chess puzzle in this one our heuristic of taking queens all the time didn't work but warnsdorf's rule works very well it's a good heuristic and that's the idea that I want us to take away from heuristics. They're an important principle we use in the design of algorithms. Often you'll design an algorithm with a heuristic in mind going, okay, so this, this heuristic, it works and we're going to incorporate it into our algorithm. Uh, obviously with, a, with an eye to the fact that it sometimes will give you the wrong results. But yeah, that's basically the idea behind heuristics. 
They're one of the things you take into account when you do an algorithm. Okay. Now, finally, uh, I don't think we're going to do this. We'll be dealing with the knapsack problem later anyway. So, yeah, next week we have sufficient groundwork to do actual algorithms. And here's the extra, extra for experts. Two things that I didn't write, two heuristics, famous heuristics, that I didn't write things about because I didn't think that they would be like at the level that this needs to be taught at. Basically, they are two very cool concepts which are used all the time. Like so far, like Warnsdorf's rule, Google isn't using that to get you your search results. It, they're using it maybe to like move a knight around on a little board, but they're not using it to solve the world's problems. These algorithms are being used all the time. A star is a pathfinding algorithm. No, wait, it's a search algorithm. I'm being stupid. Uh, anyway, A star is an algorithm which basically, it, it just works like a normal algorithm. Uh, in fact, if we do the Google definition, I bet it will have the worst heuristic, in like the first 15 words or something. Yeah. It's an extension of an algorithm we're going to study called Dijkstra's algorithm, but it's more complicated. And the way it is more complicated is by using heuristics to guide its search. It uses heuristics to help it along. And it is used all the time. It's one of the best ones we have today to solve the problem of uh, routing or like graph traversal. Uh, those are some fancy words, but basically you can think of those one great application of routing and graph traversal is finding paths in like, well, there's some yelling downstairs. Sorry, I've been a bit distracted this, this uh, session because there's been some stuff going on downstairs that's a bit worrying. But never mind. Uh, basically, you use heuristics to uh, to guide your algorithm to make it make better decisions faster. Because this problem, graph traversal and path search, is very difficult. It takes a lot of time if you just try to actually get the best solution. But A star doesn't get the best solution all the time. It's just the best solution in many cases, and it works a whole lot faster. So it uses heuristics and neural networks. Who's heard of a neural network before? It's all good, I think. It's all good. Who's heard of a neural network? Like your brain. Yeah, like your brain. They're like computer brains. Connections. I believe, who is this? Jessica. You're like the one person who's talking in this chat. People, come on. Speak, be social. Uh, no, no, that, that, you're, you're doing good. Good on you. Yeah. Good on you, Carolyn and Evie. Uh, good on yous. You're here and hi. Have you heard of a neural network? And if not, that's fine. That is very much fine because they are like, I was gonna say they're university level, but they're like not university level. They're worse. They're like uh, professional computer science researcher level. They're whack. I, I don't understand a thing about them, but I'm still teaching a class. Uh, they're really whack. Basically, they're a way to try and program a computer to think like a human brain which is hugely epic. Like, has anyone seen those weird distorted images from Dali uh, images? It was making the news a little while back because it, it these, these pretty little artistic pictures, okay, maybe not those, but these pretty little artistic pictures were not made by a human being. They were made by an AI. They were not made by a human being. Like the stuff we're looking at here is not art that was drawn or painted by anyone living or breathing. This is stuff that was made by a computer trained to think like a brain. That's pretty cool. There are obviously better applications, like we could have an AI running our health system in 15 years. That will be a pretty cool application. But neural networks, what they are, a lot of people don't talk about this, but they're not actually optimal. They're not, oh yeah, TikTok. Uh, TikTok uses neural networks, most certainly they do, uh, to, for a vast variety of things filters and the algorithms that they use to sort and search things. They use that, they use it for that as well. Like recommending which things are going to go viral, which things won't. That's a huge use of neural networks. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, chess. Chess, they use neural networks. Uh, there's this thing called Stockfish, which is a chess engine. It solves chess problems for you. Uh, it would probably be pretty good at this. Uh, it would find this move for you in like half a millisecond. And it uses neural networks. Neural networks are everywhere. But what a lot of people forget is that they're approximations. They don't get the right answer all the time. 
And the reason why is because the human brain doesn't get the right answer all the time, and that's what they model on. The reason they don't get the right answer all the time, and yet they're still so important, is because they use heuristics. They don't get the right answer, but they don't need to. They get a right answer, an answer that's close enough to right that it doesn't really matter that it's wrong. Like when you have, uh, for example, this person does not exist.com. These are made by general adversarial networks, but I think those are a, a case of neural networks. This person doesn't exist. He doesn't. He was made by a computer. He just does not exist, and yet he looks so real. Neural networks, uh, if you reload a, a bunch of times and look into this long enough, you'll find that neural networks can sometimes make like slightly unrealistic looking faces. A, a lot of people, like I myself have spent like hours just scrolling through this going, hey, that person isn't real. That person isn't real. It's pretty cool. Uh, sometimes they will screw up. They will make like people that don't really look like people, but that's fine because 99% of the time, 99% of the time, they get people that look close enough to people that we can go, whoa, that's crazy, as one person just did in the chat. And it is crazy. And that's heuristics. So this was a pretty theoretical session. Next time we're going to be delving into algorithms. I've taken you a little too far over time and I'm terribly sorry for that. Uh, won't do that again. It's been good talking to you. I hope you take something away from this. Maybe something you can apply to your daily life about those different uh, cool algorithm design strategies that we talked about here. Mixing two images. So much more than that. It's like they mix millions of images at once and then add some creativity to that as well. Yeah, very cool, yeah. Thank you and have a good night as well. Uh, yeah.